Step 3. Condition and action clauses. Let's have a more detailed look at these clauses and see what they are all about. So we have said that condition and action clauses determine the node behavior in a decentralized, autonomous way, while also allowing for coordinated behavior. So condition clauses, they act as tri triggers for the action clauses of the node. So they are the ones that make the node do the actions and at the right, uh, at the appropriate time. They could be very simple, there could be a single clause per rule, or in more complicated uh, cases, there could be multiple, action, uh, multiple condition clauses per rule. And the rule sets are continuously monitoring the state of the resource table, or of the resources. As soon as there are enough resources, some con conditional case clause will trigger and uh, an appropriate action clause will get executed. An example would be checking whether there we have enough resources. Here, this action clause enough resource has two parameters. The partner, that's the address of the partner node with whom we are going to share bell pairs. And the number is the threshold number of bell pairs that we are checking for. For example, if we have entanglement swapping, it would be just one. If we have purification, it would be two. Action clauses tell the node what to do. This could be anything from unitary gates, measurements, qubit resource reallocation, or classical message transfer. And they are executed immediately after the condition clauses are satisfied. And, uh, for example, we could have single clauses, or we could also have multiple clauses, as we will see in our examples later. An example action clause would be the bell state measurement. Here, we need to pass two parameters into our bell state measurement action clause, and they are the addresses of the qubits on which we are going to perform the bell state measurement. Let's look at some examples. First example we're going to consider is the entanglement swapping. We've got three nodes, A, B, and C, and we are going to perform entanglement swapping on node B. In this case, we are sharing bell pairs between these two qubits of quantum memory at node A and this orange memory at node B. And also B is entangled with node C um, via this link over here. So B must know that it has to perform entanglement swapping or the bell state measurement on qubit 1 and qubit 2. And send the classical message informing node A and node C of what the classical measurement outcome was. So the condition clause would look something like this. First, node B needs to check whether it's sharing enough resources with node A. As we said, and as the picture shows, we only need a single bell pair. So the partner address is set to A, and the number, which gives us the threshold number of bell pairs, is set to 1. Similarly, it needs to share a single bell pair, or at least one bell pair, with node C. So we set the partner address to C, and threshold number to 1. Once these uh, two conditions are satisfied, the action is triggered. In this case, it's bell state measurement at qubit 1 and qubit 2. Here, qubit 1 and qubit 2 are giving us the physical addresses of the qubits inside node B, q1 and q2. Once that is uh, finished, and these uh, qubits qubit 1 and qubit 2 are measured in the bell state basis, uh, node B needs to send the result to uh, node A via this send result action. And also the same needs to happen, but with node C. And this concludes our rule for um, entanglement swapping. Next, we're going to look at purification. Purification is slightly more complicated in the sense that we are requiring to share two bell pairs, after which we can start with a purification protocol. In this example, we're only considering purification um, for X errors, which are introduced via the bit flip channel. So after sharing two bell pairs between nodes A and B, we apply a C naught um, at node A and C naught at node B, measure the second bell pair in the Z basis, and send the classical results to our neighboring nodes. This example is also slightly more complicated because we require two rules per rule set. Here we're going to concentrate on the rule set that's in possession of node A. So the rule number one 
would look something like this. First, we have to check whether we have enough resources shared between A and B. So node A is constantly checking if it's sharing at least two bell pairs with node B. Once that condition clause is satisfied, the action clause is triggered. Node A applies a CNode gate, where qubit 1, this blue qubit, is the control, and the orange qubit, qubit 2, is the target. After the CNode, node A measures qubit 2, the orange qubit, in the Z basis. And it puts uh, the classical outcome in a classical message and sends it to node B. If we wanted to write this rule for node B, it would look very similar, just we would have to change the partner address over here. And also send the result to destination A. After rule 1 is finished, we uh, promote the resources to rule 2. And in this case, we have two conditional clauses with two separate corresponding action clauses. Condition clause 1 checks whether the parity of the outcomes in the Z basis is even. In order to for that to happen, node A first needs to receive the classical message from node B. And if the classical um, outcomes were 0, 0 or 1, 1, so if the parity is even, then we know that the correct action to do is to keep the bell pair. So the rule instructs node A to keep qubit 1. Similarly, if the Condition clause 2 is triggered. This is when the parity is odd. So the classical measurement outcomes are 0, 1 or 1, 0. Then action clause 2 is triggered, which instructs the node to discard qubit 1. If we wanted, we could easily rewrite this for node B as well. This way you can see how to achieve decentralized, autonomous, but coordinated action between the nodes with minimal exchange of classical messages. That about covers the basics of rules and rule sets and condition and action clauses. In the next step, we're going to put everything together and talk about connection setup.